Okay, so uh, I'm going to continue the introduction to log geometry. Uh, well, essentially, in the the uh, this introduction to log geometry by talking about what kind of information is contained in log morphism. So so far, I gave you lots of examples of uh, log schemes. Uh, really the most general examples we're going to deal with, uh, and said, well, if you have a morphism between pairs, then it's a log morphism as long as the inverse image of the divisor and the target is contained in the uh, domain divisor. Well, let's look at some more interesting examples. So the first example is a very frequent situation where we have a morphism from a log scheme x to the standard log point, spec k dagger, uh, which, if you recall, is the log scheme spec k along with the monoid k star plus n. So in order to give a log morphism, what do we need in order to give such a log morphism? Uh, what do we need? Well, let's call this map F. Well, first of all, the map on underlying schemes is just turning X into a scheme defined over spec K in the usual sense in algebraic geometry. So there's no new information there. Um, so now let's look to see what would happen to F flat. So F flat will be morphism from the of sheaves from the, the constant sheaf given by pullback of k star plus n. So this is the constant sheaf on x with uh, uh, this stalk uh, and then mapping to mx. And recall this has to be compatible with the structure maps. So of course, pullback of functions just takes an element of the field to the constant function on x. <coughs> and in particular, this tells us exactly what happens to the k star factor. Right? Because the k star factor maps into k star here. So k star plus 0 maps to k star here, maps to something in here which has to map to the same k copy of k star inside ox. So that tells us that k star maps to the inverse image of k star in mx. So f inverse of k star plus 0 maps to, let's give this name alpha x, to alpha x uh, inverse of k star, thinking k star is inside of x star. <clears throat> so we don't need to say where this k star is. The only thing that happens that we need to know is what happens to uh, element 1 in here. So something direct sum, say 1, 1. Um, so we just, just need to specify uh, f flat 1, 1, that you take it to some element in here. And there's only one constraint which comes from coming to the of the diagram, which is that 1, 1 maps to 0 in here, hence to 0 in here. So 1, 1 has to map to something in the uh, inverse image of 0. So it must satisfy. So let's call this element rho. Uh, and this must satisfy the uh, identity alpha x of rho. So subject to that constraint, that's the only information encoded in a morphism to the standard log point. It's just the choice of a section of mx with image under alpha being 0. OK, so that's uh, not very much information, but it's some extra information. Now, you know, if you're reading a book on algebraic geometry like Harshore, you at some point, he tells you what a map to spec k means, and he also tells you what a map from spec k into a scheme is. That's just a choice of a point. So let's do the same thing here. What does it mean to give 
a morphism from spec k dagger into a log scheme x. Okay, well, um, I again have to, of course, this involves a choice of point. The image of the, the map, uh, call this map f, and then we also have to specify f flat. So we have f flat will be a map from uh, f inverse mx. And what's the inverse image of mx? That's just the, uh, uh, so the pullback to a point, just the stock at that point. That's um, equal to mx x. And then we have to map to the, uh, the uh, monoid sheet here, which is just k star plus n. Now, <coughs> I'm going to use a fact which we, I, I, is not so hard to prove. So uh, I can split this. I can choose the splitting of mxx as ox x star plus m bar xx. This is only true, the fact that you can split this is only true at the stock level. You can't split at the uh, level of sheaves. Now, I'll show you an example of this in, in a minute just to convince you that everything's all right. Uh, so we have to define a map from here to here. And of course, we have compatibility with the structure maps, the OXX, and then we have a diagram like this. This lower map, F star, is just evaluation at the point x. So it takes a regular function, phi, in here, and evaluates it at the point x. OK, so again, uh, there's a certain amount of information. We know what happens to this piece, is this maps into here, and then we just evaluate it at x. So the only question is what's happening to the m bar xx. So this diagram is completely determined by map from m bar xx to k star plus n. So there's two pieces of information here. Uh, first of all, there's, so this is. In the fine saturated case, this is just a nice toric monoid. So it's a map from a nice toric monoid to n. That's an element of the dual monoid. And then there's some continuous information, which is a choice of a map from that monoid to k star. So this is determined, i.e., an element of uh, com n bar x, x into n. Now, I'll leave a bit of black space here, because I'll come back to this. Sir? So we have an element, uh, a, a homomorphism, a monoid homomorphism from n bar x, x into n, and uh, an element of the algebraic torus constraint that still comes from commutativity of this diagram, which is suppose we take something in here which is non-zero, that maps to something in here, 
Suppose it maps to some, there's something non-zero in here, maps to something that's zero in N here. Well, something that's non-zero in here is going to map by the structure map to zero. And, well, sorry, it's going to be, I take the value zero at the point. Uh, so that means that, sorry? So the point is, if we have something map, something in m bar xx which maps to zero here, uh, then of course when you finish going around the diagram, you get something non-zero here. But if you go around this way, uh, m bar xx, of course, this stuff has to be in the kernel. The non-zero stuff here is in the kernel of this map. Uh, so you run into trouble. So let me do this an example to make it a bit clearer. Uh, so. The thing I want to say here is that uh, this map shouldn't be zero on any element of m bar except zero. And we say that that's in the interior of the monoid. So if you think of a monoid as being given by a cone intersecting the lattice, uh, the point has to be in the interior of that cone. But let me, let me try to make that a bit clearer. I think that was not quite so clear. Let's do an example. Let's take x to be a2 along with the divisorial log structure coming from the vanishing of the coordinate axes. And there's our variety. And then we have spec k dagger mapping to the origin case. Okay. So first of all, let me explain that splitting. So, we have a map from m bar a2 at the origin, which, if you recall, is n2, just given by uh, recording the orders of vanishing of functions along the x and y axes. Uh, we can map to m a2 stop here just by taking a pair alpha beta to x to the alpha, y to the beta. So in other words, once you've chosen co local coordinates, it's easy to define splitting. Okay, so then then if you um, look to see what happens to x the alpha of y to the beta uh, around this side of the square is going to go to, well, it goes to x the alpha y to the beta in here, but we then evaluate it at the origin and we get zero, unless alpha and beta are both zero. So that means that alpha beta, if alpha beta is non-zero, it has to go to something non-zero over in the n factor up there. I do have a point. Where do I put it? Uh -huh. um, sorry, talking? No. Uh, yeah, so if you have alpha beta up here, mapping something zero here, you're going to run into trouble unless alpha beta. Is zero. So that's uh, why I like this, that this has to be in the interior of that line. Some particular. The math uh, n squared to n uh, is determined by a, b in n squared minus, uh, well, in n squared, by alpha beta maps to a alpha plus b beta, and neither a nor b can be zero. So you know, up to that constraint, uh, I've now completely described all law of morphs. So there's a lot of uh, log logmorphisms from the standard log point into x. So already there's a lot of information here. There's this combinatorial information of this choice of a, b in n squared, in the interior of n squared. And then there's some continuous information, namely an element of this algebraic torus, uh, which in this case is, again, a two-dimensional 
algebra and torus. So you should really view this as being where the real power of logarithmic geometry lies, that there's a lot more information, there can be a lot more information hiding in morphisms than immediately is visible. Now the questions, uh, the next question is how do we interpret all this extra information? So to explain that, uh, I'm going to talk about tropicalization of logarithmic schemes. And this is one of the key ways of trying to visualize the extra information contained inside log geometry. And now I'll return to this example and try to give a better intuition as to what all this extra information means. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, as usual here, uh, focus on FS. Um, I won't go into the technical details of why that's important, but uh, I'll, I'll mention where it comes in. So let's let x be an fs log scheme. And if you take a point x and x, and you take a look at, well, define sigma x to be the set of homomorphisms from m bar x x into r greater than zero, greater or equal to zero. So this is the additive, let me write a plus here, just to make clear it's the additive monomer. Uh, so if you were doing toric geometry, you would recognize this. This is, well, it's the dual, uh, so in toric geometry, if you start with a fan, you start with a cone, you dualize the cone, and you intersect with the lattice. We're going backwards here. You have the intersection of the dual cone with the lattice, and we're building the original cone. So this is the cone that would appear in a fan if x was a toric variety. Uh, okay, so then if x and y points to x with x in the closure of y, I'm really going to see there here, um, then there's a generalization. This is a general sheaf, sheaf theoretic construction. goes from m bar x x to m bar x y. How does the generalization map work? Well, an element in here is a germ, an open neighborhood of x, and a section of m bar on the open set. Now, an open neighborhood of x is also an open neighborhood of y. So therefore, that also determines a term in M bar x y. So this is a standard construction that works in any uh, uh, Freddy sheaf on a scheme, or sheaf anywhere. Um, and this induces you now dualize. You take homomorphisms into R greater or equal to zero. And this induces a map sigma y bar uh, to sigma x. Sorry, sigma y to sigma x. Now, the special thing about FS log schemes, and you, you figure this out just by trying this out for a toric variety, is that this is an inclusion of faces. So 
that comes from the FS function. Okay, so for every point in the scheme X, we have a cone, and then for every generalization, we have an inclusion of faces. So what we do now is we just glue together all these cones via these face inclusions. So, of course, at you know, some point Y, I might have many different points in the closure with different cones, so you glue them together via those inclusions of faces. So we define sigma of x to be the polyhedral cone complex obtained by gluing together all the sigma x by the space map. Okay, so um, there's some technical issues about this. Uh, we have a paper that's going to come out hopefully in a week or two. Uh, which um, on with uh, Berendt and, and Chile Chen and Dan and Bromwich, which will explain this in much more detail. Um, but uh, let, let's do this, for example. Uh, so for example, suppose we take P2 with its torque boundary, which would be a union of three lines. So, this locally looks like uh, two coordinate axes in, in A2. Uh, we have so at the general point, there's no ghost sheath, the ghost sheath is zero, and we have copies of N along each of these three lines, and then at these points we have N squares. So the dual cones associated with the N squares are just, starting to board, are just copies of uh, the first quadrant of so if we have three points which are, I can give you quadrants as their cones. Let me draw like this. Here's a quadrant. Here's a quadrant. Here's a quadrant. And then we have all these points on these lines where we just get a ray, the dual to n. And those all get identified with the cone uh, corresponding to the, uh, the cone coming from the generic point of one of these lines. So we get these rays. And of course, we also get just the point, which is the cone associated with any point away from the coordinate axis. And now we get these, we glue these all together by the kind of obvious inclusion maps. This is a good exercise to check. And what you get is, unsurprisingly, the fan for P2. So in general, if you apply this to a Torah variety, standard torque structure, standard torque logic structure, we call that the divisorial log structure, where you just take as divisor the complement of the big torus orbit, then you just get the fan for the torque variety back. So I recommend this as an exercise to really make sure you understand everything. I think if you understand this exercise, you understand log schemes. Uh, with a standard torque log structure is the fan. Let's say, 
x is a fan for x, but only as an abstract polyhedral complex. get here is three quadrants glued together. We don't know how they're sitting inside the plane. Uh, there's no information about that. Okay, so the other point to make is that this construction of tropicalization is functorial. schemes, and let's say you have x in x mapping to f of x in y, then of course you have the induced map, or right, is f bar flat for n bar y, f of x, n bar x, x. We then dualize this map, and we get a map from cones from sigma x to sigma y. I'll write that as sigma. Okay, so and then everything glues together. Okay, so we have a functor from the category of log schemes to the category of polyhedral complexes. And essentially what this does is it encodes the combinatorial aspects of the of log morphisms. And as we saw in this example, if we go now back to the example of the affine plane, Tropicalization of spec K dagger. That's very easy. You look at Hom n into r greater equal to zero. Of course, that's just a ray. R greater equal to zero. You just choose where one maps to there. And here it turns out all you have to do is look at what's happening in the origin. While all other cones of trop end up being faces of this. This is just r. Squared. And so then you have an induced morphism like this, and that morphism takes one, you unwind the definitions, takes one to this element AD, which was determining the map where AD determines the map. From M bar A2 at the origin to N. Remember that was this combinatorial information was contained in the wall morphism from spec K dagger to the origin, uh, which I wrote as AB, taking alpha beta to A alpha plus B beta. And once you dualize, all you're doing is you're re reading off what that element. Okay, and this condition that neither A or B is zero that we showed earlier is just saying that this has to lie in the interior of this cone. Okay, so now we have a very simple picture. So I have the cone for A2, so this is sigma of A2, and then the we have the image of this map, of this map from spec K dagger from the tropicalization, 
just gives us some gray in the interior. Now, if you're comfortable with turret geometry, you recognize this picture as giving possibly a subdivision of the fan defining A2. This corresponds to a toric blow up of A2. choice of a log blow up of A2. And the way to think about the continuous information, the element of the algebraic torus, is that it's a point on the exceptional divisor of the blow up. So the continuous, so the, an element upon M bar A2 origin K star and determines a point on the exceptional divisor. you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, this was an n squared, so this is a two-dimensional algebraic torus. This is k star squared, whereas the exceptional divisor, we're blowing up a surface, the exceptional divisor is a p1, and if we choose a point sort of in the toric interior of that p1, that's just a single copy of k star. Uh, so there's a bit of a mismatch. But you can fix that by observing that uh, some Morphisms from spec K dagger can be identified by an automorphism of spec K dagger. This describes all morphisms spec K dagger to A2, well, to the origin in A2, uh, up to automorphisms. of the spec K dagger. In other words, uh, where you equate two maps to A2, if there's an automorphism of spec K dagger making this map commute. And notice now the dimensions work, because what does it mean to give an automorphism of spec K dagger? The crucial thing, of course, the N has to map isomorphically to N, since there's an automorphism. But the n can map to any, or so one and n can map to any element in the k star. So there's a k star worth of automorphisms. And so if you divide this k star squared out by the action of that k star, you'll find exactly a description of the exceptional divisor toric blow up. Okay, so I would recommend, if you really want to understand what information is hiding in log geometry, make sure you understand everything I've said so far today. So that's, that's the exercise for, uh, for absorbing what's going on. Um, so I mean, you should view this as something beautiful. What's really going on, when you specify a map from spec k dagger into a nice log scheme, you're specifying some point on some arbitrary toric block of the log scheme. So it sees sort of all of the bi toric birational geometry without having to actually ever blow up the log scheme. And this is really where we win in terms of uh, avoiding the complexity of actually blowing things up. Any other 
just one blood? Uh, well, okay, so I have a question from the audience here. Uh, is this any blow up or just one blow up? So if we just have a map from a point, that is going to select out one particular exceptional divisor. Uh, so you can always extract some divisor. Um, yeah, if you could blow up things any way you want, as long as that divisor is sitting there. So for example, I could subdivide this further, but all I care about is that there is this one exceptional divisor uh, in there. Uh, now, later on, we're going to see maps from more complicated log schemes like curves, and then you might have to see lots of different components of the log, lots of exceptional divisors, if you want to see it geometrically. Okay, so this is uh, yeah, really, well, I can't emphasize too much, this is where all the intuition about uh, log geometries is hiding. Okay, so. Let's move on. So now let's talk about log smooth curves. So let's let uh, let's let pi from c to w be logarithmic. Now I'm going to adapt a new terminology which I'm going to attempt to stick to from now on, and this is one of the standard uh, things uh, terminologies. Uh, there are various conventions, but when I talk about a log scheme, I just write down a letter, and when I talk about the underlying scheme where I forget the log structure. I underline the letter. So C underline and W underline for the underlying schemes. And this will be important because sometimes I really just want to think of schematic properties and sometimes I want to think about log properties. Okay. So now I'm going to add some conditions to it. So such that, first of all, pi is log smooth. That's something I defined last time, and flat. Now, already, if you're familiar with smoothness, you might be a bit puzzled is smooth morphisms in the, for schemes are flat. And this is something you have to get used to. In the log category, they need not be flat. In fact, a toric blow up of a toric variety is log at all, but it's definitely not flat. So there's some getting used to things there. Mistakes get made with quite a bit of frequency in that one. Mention famous names, but I won't. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second is all steam theoretic fibers. are reduced and dimension one. So it is a flat family. I mean, if you forget all this logs, if you forget all the log stuff, it is just a flat family of curves, of reduced curves. So that's something we should feel comfortable with. But then we impose this extra condition of being log flat, uh, of being, sorry, being flat. Uh, so this is a family of, of log curves. Okay, 
So, um, you know, it's a very slight generalization of the notion of a family of, of ordinary curves. Uh, you know, for example, you might consider families of smooth curves, but I think you've, you've seen some introduction to growing Witten theory, and normally you don't consider smooth curves in growing Witten theory. You have to allow curves to degenerate to nodal curves, curves with nodes. Now, happily in this case, we don't need to because they're already there. Right? Slot smooth curves can have nodes. Um, so there's a classification. So but I don't know, classification is the right word, but description of uh, log smooth curves or of log curves over um, the spectrum of a complete local ring. Uh, now, I've written W underline because I haven't told you the log structure yet. You need a log structure on this. And we'll specify a log structure by specifying a chart, something we did last time. So we have a um, log structure. Coming from a chart, I just have to give a morphism from a monoid, a toric monoid, to A. Remember how this defines a log structure on spec A. Well, it defines a map from a ring homomorphism from K bracket Q to A, and then you take spectra, so you have the morphism from W into a toric variety, and you pull back the standard log structure. So if I write a map like this, let's call this phi, that determines the log structure. Phi should be a monoid homomorphism. So C has three sorts of points. So C has three kinds of points. So this is going to be a tall local description for C. Uh, so first of all, points I call general. So locally in a, a tall neighborhood of such a point, uh, C is isomorphic to the spec A bracket X, so it's just that it looks tall locally. This is Oh, it just looks like an affine line over spec A. And I also have to tell you the log structure, so maybe I should underline this. That's just the scheme. Uh, the log structure, or chart for C, so chart for log structure, is given by Q to A back X is just given by Q goes to phi. So it doesn't involve the variable x at all. Everything is pulled back from W. So the way to think about this is really just a, a piece of curve where the log structure looks very uniform. It's just all pulled back from the base of the curve W. That's the boring point. Let me draw a picture of a curve. 
So what we're going to see, uh, we're going to get things like this, where there might also be some mark points. This is what you should visualize, C, or at least C, zero, the, the fiber over, over the closed point. Um, so we've just described sort of what's happening generically, where the monoid at a general point is just Q. The, the monoid of the, the stock of the Gauche at a general point is Q. So then we have a second sort of point, which are these points I'm indicated by mark points. So in a tall neighborhood of a mark point, again, it just looks like a smooth curve. So C underline is isomorphic to spec A bracket X again. And so that's so far no different. It's just an affine line over spec A. But the chart changes. The log structure, the log chart, is given by Q plus an extra factor N to A back at X. And this map is given by QN maps to 5 Q X the N. So you should think, suppose Q was 0, so you didn't have this here. This would just be a chart for the divisorial log structure. It would be just saying, well, we map, what, does the, what is this going to give? It's going to give a map to spec k bracket n, map to a1, and we just pull back the divisorial log structure given by the origin in a1. So um, this corresponds to, well, if q is 0, it would just be the divisorial log structure at this point. And if q is non-zero, it's really some kind of sum amalgamated sum of the logs of this generic log structure plus the um, plus the, the divisorial log structure at the point. So this is going to be the way that we are going to deal with mark points, which is something you always want to do in Grove Wooden Theory. It's in there for free. Okay, well as suggested, there's a third kind of point, namely the nodal points.
Okay, so uh, first let me write down what this map is. So uh, this is going to be a quotient of the ordinary direct sum. I'll explain what it's a quotient by in a second. So first I'll tell you what it does, the elements of the ordinary direct sum. It takes Q and AB to 5Q times X to the A times Y to the B. So that should look somewhat familiar with the things we've seen before. And um, this uh, direct sum here, let me just tell you what the maps are. So in, um, uh, Q plus N and squared, this is a push out, uh, is defined by maps. It's defined in maps. Uh, n to q given by 1 goes to rho, and n to n squared given by 1 goes to 1, 1. Now, if you don't like push outs in the category monoids, which take a little bit of thinking about, this is just this is just equal to Q plus N squared modulo the equivalence relation where something in the form alpha plus rho uh, beta gamma is equivalent to alpha beta plus one gamma plus one. So you just always move a rho on this side over to one gamma on that side. And notice that this fits exactly with this formula, right? Because this 1, 1 here maps to x times y. x times y is supposed to be equal to 5 rho, so that fits. Right? 1, 1 and rho are the same thing. So it's just really encoding the equation. So you know, the way to think about this, again, there's some information hiding here. Let's suppose that A was just the field, so when W was just a point. Then, of course, phi rho will just be zero. Uh, so we just have a nodal curve over a field. But somehow, this nodal curve remembers some information about how it's being smoothed. It's really being smoothed over a torque variety, sitting in, in a family over a torque variety, the torque variety spec k bracket q. And it remembers that. And it remembers that it's being given by an equation over that. Uh, fam over that, that torque variety, it, the family is given by this equation. So it's really a curve that remembers how it's being smooth, what kind of family it's living in. Okay, so let's, um, so you know, really the key point, if you want to do go wooden theory, you need nodal curves with marked points. And law of geometry gives us that without ever having to put it in by hand. That's what a log smooth curve is. It's, it's a nodal curve with marked points. Now, let me, let me return to this example. Let's understand how to now tropicalize one of these curves. make life easy. Let's take, uh, sorry, let's take W to be K star plus Q. So this is not necessarily the standard log point. If um, uh, Q is uh, N, this will be the standard log point. Here alpha is kind of the obvious map. Chanel be viewed as the obvious map takes R Q to either R if Q is equal to zero and zero to Q is not zero. But it's just a generalization, standard log point. There are lots of log points in this business. Okay, 
so if this is pi, we now get by functoriality, we now get a map between cone complexes, polyhedral cone complexes. And what I want to try to do is describe for you the fiber of this map. So let's first understand what sigma of w is. Well, there's one point in w. All you have to do is take the cone, the dual cone of this model. Uh, so this will be, let me call it sigma q. This is just hom q into r greater than or equal to zero. So if we were talking toric varieties, this would be a cone and a fan defining the monoid q. Okay, so now we have some kind of family parameterized by this cone. So this is the analogy. So now let's try to understand. We have these three sorts of points here. Let's try to understand what the cones associated with these three different sorts of points are. gives just a cone, which is the same as sigma q. OK, so second case is that t is a mark point. And by the way, we, we follow this naming convention in our paper, so we always, generic points of course are eta, mark points are p. Uh, so p is a mark point. Um, of C. What happens there? Well, I think the mark points, let's see, where are these? Uh, unfortunately, the mark point got erased, but remember the chart for the mark point uh, was given by Q plus N. And at a mark point, the stop of the ghost sheet is, well, you have the Q coming from the base, and then you have the extra N, because you have to record the vanishing order of functions. So M bar C P is Q plus N. And um, well, what's the dual? So sigma P is just sigma Q cross r greater equal to zero. And the morphism, so pi bar flat, that's just inclusion in the first component. And so sigma of pi, we dualize inclusion, sigma of pi is just a projection on the first component. So we just have a family of rays over sigma q. So each mark point um, gives, a fam gives rise to a family of, of copies of r greater equal to zero. OK, so then we have the nodes. So q, a node. So 
we saw that uh, m bar c at, Q, at point q coincides with the, uh, the monoid that we're using for the chart. That's q plus n, n squared. Uh, one standard fact is when you dualize objects, uh, fiber sum turns into fiber product. So, uh, sigma q, this is um, m bar c q bar zero, can be written as a fiber product. Sigma q cross over r greater equal to zero, r greater equal to zero squared. And in the fiber product, I need to tell you what these maps are. They're dual, they're transposes to the maps I described earlier. The map from this n to q, recall, was 1 goes to rho. Let me write this in the diagram here. This is 1 goes to rho, and this is 1 goes to 1, 1. <laughs> so dually in this fiber product, let me also draw that as a diagram. In this fiber product, we have sigma q. Back into r greater equal to zero, and we have r greater equal to zero squared, mapping to r greater to zero. This map is just given by evaluation on rho. Right? Rho is an element of q, uh, so the evaluation of rho gives you a map from sigma q to r greater equal to zero. This map was given by one goes as transpose of one goes to one one, so this map is a b goes to a plus b. So, in other words, what's, what's a fiber? So, if you fix a point in, uh, in sigma q, what's a fiber of the fiber product? Well, let me write it down. So, you know, sigma q cross over r greater than zero, r greater than zero squared. I want to now describe a fiber of this map here. Because this map is going to be the map from the cone sigma uh, sigma little q to the cone uh, sigma capital Q. Uh, so fiber of this map is the same as a fiber of this map. And a fiber of this map, so I'm going to call this, this map is sigma of pi. So sigma of pi inverse of q, or some q in sigma q, oh, sorry, let me not use q, uh, that's the point sigma of m. <coughs> this is just the set of all a, b in r greater equal to 0 squared, uh, such that a plus b agrees with the image of m under the map row. row of m. So this is just in r greater equal to zero squared is just a diagonal line segment whose length is given by rho of that. Okay, so those are the three sorts of points, and now we can try to put this all together. So let me return to this picture here. Yeah, so, I mean, let me, let me recap this. So, uh, this gives uh, a family of line segments over sigma q whose length is determined by rho. Okay, so let me return to this example. <laughs> So fiber of sigma of pi 
from sigma of c to sigma w over n from sigma of w. Okay, well, sigma of c contains lots of codes, one for each point, uh, each type of point, one for each generic point, one for each mark point, and one for each nodal point. Uh, the fibers of the cones corresponding to generic points are just points. So in other words, a fiber of uh, each generic point uh, of C, in other words, each irreducible component of C, gives rise to, let me add a bit more, gives rise to a uh, point in the inverse image. So we have a point for each uh, generic point over here, so that looks something like that. Okay, so what does this picture mean again? It just means sigma of C contains one cone isomorphic to sigma capital Q uh, for each generic point of C. So we get one point in the fiber for every irreducible complex. Okay, so now marked points, remember the inverse image over a point in, in sigma capital Q corresponding to marked point is just an array. So each marked point gives you an array necessarily attached to the vertex corresponding to the irreducible component containing it. So in this case, you have two rays attached to this upper vertex, and you have a ray here and a ray here, or mark point here and here corresponding to rays there. Finally, we have some nodes. Uh, so we have four nodes, and each node is going to correspond to an edge of some length. We can't tell what length it is because I haven't told you all the details of uh, what uh, row is and so on. Um, but you do get edges. So uh, let me do these three nodes first. So this gives us edges connecting those vertices that corresponds to these two nodes. Uh, we have edge connecting these two vertices. And then self nodes are slightly more complicated. That results in um, gluing the ends of the edge together and gives you a loop. So self, uh, self nodes correspond to loops. Uh, that requires defining. Be a bit careful about how you actually define tropicalization. So that's the, the fiber of this map over a general point of uh, sigma of W. Now, again, you should recognize this. This is the dual complex, usually the dual intersection graph of this curve. Uh, it's also can be viewed as a tropical curve, so it's a metric graph in the sense that these edges come with some lengths determined by the data that I haven't specified completely. So this is already a nice thing. The tropicalization of the family of curves already gives rise to a nice bit of combinatorics. Again, classical combinatorics, but uh, we get it for free out of the, the uh, formula. So if you didn't follow the details of this derivation, you could just think of this family as a family of, of graphs uh, which just replicate the combinatorics of how the components of C meet. So we are now ready to define stable log maps. So now we're going to suddenly jump to much more sophisticated situation. So uh, hopefully Michelle's uh, introductory lectures, he defined a, a stable map. I assume if he's doing our wind theory, that would be natural. So So X has to be morphism of log schemes. So here, uh, I just want you to think X is going to be our target space for going with the theory. S is, uh, uh, but it's often interesting to work not just over a single scheme, but think about a family of schemes. So you think about a scheme over some base scheme S. Uh, we're going to do the same thing. S is, should just be used as the base scheme. 
Uh, it's more important here than in, in ordinary Graham Witten theory because we're really often going to want to deal with, say, degenerating families of Caudiaus, where X would be the base of the family and X would be the total space of the family. Or if you restrict the central fiber of that family, X would be standard level. So it's really actually much more crucial. Uh, okay, so then uh, a family or a stable log now. Uh, with target x over s is a diagram I'm going to first of all have some family of log curves of the sort we've been talking about. I'm going to have morphism from C to X. And of course, if I want to work over base S, I should all, everything should be defined over X. Um, now, I want a little bit more information here. Um, remember that the C to W can come with uh, mark points. Now, mark points can sort of get, get mixed up. There could be, you know, there could be several mark points in each fiber, but there could be some monodromy interchanging them. So I want to specify mark points. So along with in section uh, P1 through Pn uh, from underlying scheme of W to the underlying scheme of C, uh, they should be disjoint. And such that these sections show exactly where the mark points are. So whose images coincide with the mark points. Of C. Okay, so in other words, right, the mark points, that was an intrinsic logarithmic notion now, but I'm labeling them. Each mark point is the image of one of these sections. Now we have some conditions, so where, so first of all, let me put the instrumentation written as f from c over w to x, or x over s to one, and then also mark points. Where, first of all, pi is a family of log curves, as I already defined. And now here's the thing that might be slightly surprising, because we're not transporting uh, the definitions word for word uh, to the law category. What we're going to do is we're going to insist that F underlying, the underlying morphism of Uh, schemes to X is a stable family of curves in the ordinary sense. There's a family. There's a stable family. Okay, so in other words, uh, any contracted component of genus zero has to have at least three mark points or nodes on it, and a genus one contracted component has to have at least one special point. Uh, so that's just saying that we have finite automorphism groups for these, these maps. 
Okay, so that's the definition of stable above map. It's just a sort of very slight uh, decorator. I mean, we're just decorating everything with block structures. Um, we uh, get the fact that we have a lot of nodal curves of marked points for free, uh, and stability, we just appeal to the usual definition of stability. Okay, so now uh, I can say the main theorem of logarithm wooden theory. Now, there are various versions of this, uh, but this is uh, various versions of myself. Uh, Barrent uh, is also Brombach Chen, and various extra pieces. Uh, technical points were also worked out by some others, so um, let me just set up my two main names over plus Marcus and Wise. Filled in a couple of um, technical points which allowed us to generalize the most general state. Uh, okay, so the first is that uh, there exists a moduli space. And beta x over s of stable log maps of, I'll just write this as type beta. Now, um, when you're doing ordinary Gorham Witten theory, if you want to get a nice, you know, say, you know, project proper moduli space, finite type moduli space, you of course have to specify the degree of the image, maybe you specify the homology class of the image of the curve. You certainly have to specify the, the genus of the curve and the number of marked points. So that, that's the kind of information you want to put in beta. A curve class, um, so beta is a curve class. Genus plus genus plus number of marked points. And there's going to be a little bit of extra information, which I'll explain shortly, uh, plus something we call contact orders. You should think of it as generalization orders of tangency at the marked points. So uh, first, there is this homology space. Um, so if x to s is proper, then the homology space itself is proper over s. And thirdly, if further x to s is log smooth, then this moduli space carries a virtual fundamental class. So uh, I'm not going to try to talk about virtual fundamental classes at all. Uh, there's just some black box that uh, you always need in Grove Witten theory because these moduli spaces usually aren't the right dimension, so you have some virtual fundamental class, which is the right dimension. Um, there are a lot of subtleties. So this is, um, you know, when you first see this statement, you might think, well, you're just duplicate what you do in the ordinary case. You just decorate everything with log structures. 
it turns out that there are a lot of subtleties in thinking about log moduli theory. So of course, this moduli space should be the usual buzzword is delete mode for the stack. It's, it's not quite a variety, but looks like the quotient of variety by a finite group. Uh, but it should also carry a logarithmic structure, because we're in the log world. And understanding what that logarithmic structure should be is really the key point. And, and that I will probably say a few words about in the, the next lecture. Um, OK, so actually, I think this is a good stopping place. I'm not quite done with my notes, but I want to spend a bit more time next time on examples uh, and say a bit more about what the tropical picture interpretation of this. And then I'll start in on some, uh, some mirror symmetry. So I think this is probably a good stopping place. Yeah, I do. I think it would be best now to switch to Skype and uh, uh, let me, I have to open my Skype. Yeah, so just call me whenever. Yeah.